Well, I hope you've been enjoying this series. We've been studying the book of Acts this fall, uh, but next week we are going to take a little bit of a pause. We've got a guest speaker coming. Uh, his name is Matt Carter. Uh, some of you may have heard that name before. Uh, uh, Matt is the founding pastor of the Austin Stone, uh, which is a large uh, megachurch in Austin that really uh, has had a lot of success over the, the years reaching uh, college students in Austin and other folks there. Uh, he, he founded that church with a, a, a little-known worship leader by the, by the name of Chris Tomlin. Um, <laughs> and uh, so that was, that was pretty cool that he had a chance to do that. And then uh, several years ago, he moved to the Houston area uh, to Pastor Sagemont Church, uh, just up the road on the Beltway, and has done that for the last couple of years. And then just recently, Matt has transitioned to serve as the Executive Vice President of Mobilization for the North American Mission Board, uh, which is an agency that plants churches all around the nation. And so he's stepping into a new role and is available to come speak to us on a Sunday. So it's a, a really uh, rare opportunity and treat to have him. So uh, make plans to be here next Sunday. It, it's going to kind of turn into a a kind of church planting Sunday because we'll have Matt speaking in the morning. And then at two o'clock uh, next Sunday afternoon, we are going to do an ordination service for Chris Cummings. Uh, Chris has been on our staff for the past seven years and uh, recently completed seminary and is preparing to plant a church uh, in Arizona. And so what ordination is, it's a spiritual time where the church recognizes the calling on a minister's life and lays hands on him and prays for him and, and, and really commissions them into the ministry. And so uh, we're going to send them out like their family won't move until December, uh, but next uh, Sunday afternoon, 2 o'clock, right here, uh, we'll, we will affirm that gifting uh, in Chris. And so if you've been blessed by his ministry and you're available to come, I know uh, we, we'd love to have it as many of you uh, be a part of that as, as possible. So that's next Sunday, uh, but for today, we're still in Acts. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and open up to Acts chapter 5. Um, Acts really is almost, you can think about Acts and then the Gospel of Luke almost as one continual story. It's written by the same author, and where Luke really focuses in on the life and ministry of Jesus, the book of Acts sees how... Uh, that ministry is carried out by the church. And, and you see a couple themes that are repeated in both Luke and Acts. Think about the, the kingdom of God that Jesus promises that this kingdom is now here and it's coming. And then in the book of Acts, you see that kingdom start to take shape and form as the New Testament church expands around the ancient world. You also see the presence of persecution where uh, Jesus faced opposition to his ministry. Ultimately, uh, those who opposed him, arrested, beat him, and crucified him. And now the, his followers are experiencing some of the same violent um, persecution as well. And then you, you see just God's power at work. I mean, one of the themes of the gospel is that Jesus really is divine. He's not just a, a dude. He's not just a regular teacher or rabbi. He is God in the flesh. And so the miracles confirm his divinity. And in the same way, in the, the book of Acts, you see that as these followers, the, the apostles are now carrying out his legacy, that the miracles that they are able to perform, they don't do in their own power, but in the name of Jesus. And so uh, God's power is at work both in Luke and in Acts. And so you, you, you see those themes throughout, and we're actually going to see pretty much all of those in today's text. So Luke chapter 5, we're going to start off verse 12, and here's what it says. It says, Many signs and wonders were being done among the people through the hands of the apostles. And they're all together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared to join them, but the people spoke well of them. Believers were added to the, um, were added to the Lord in increasing numbers, multitudes of both men and women. As a result, they would carry the sick out into the streets and lay them on cots and mats so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. In addition, a multitude came together with the town surrounding Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. 
God was moving in a powerful way during that time. And one of the things that I want you to do even this morning is as we read the text, I think it's helpful sometimes for us to to actually imagine what it would have been like to be in those shoes. Think how exciting it was to to see all these people come to faith, that this promise that Jesus had made, that that he would be lifted up amongst the nations. You see that happening before your eyes. People are getting healed. People are getting excited. And yet, there's growing opposition. That becoming a Christian is not socially acceptable. Instead, there's, there's pressure from really government forces not to believe. And if you believe, you better not say anything about it. And so people were, it's it's a mix. God was adding to the number of people who were in Christ, and yet there was increasing social pressure and government pressure not to be involved in this growing movement. Verse 17 says, Then the high priest rose up, he and all who were with him, who belonged to the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. So they arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. Now, we talked a little bit about the Sadducees last week. This was a sect within Judaism. And we we see in Scripture multiple sects. You've you've heard of the the Pharisees. And and the Pharisees were really like the fundamentalists. These are the hardcore. They want to follow every every law, every teachings of the rabbi. But the Sadducees were, were... we're, we're kind of the, the folks that the Pharisees said, man, you guys have compromised because you have aligned yourself with the Roman uh, Empire. And, and you have said, hey, listen, we, we're not going to necessarily follow everything. In fact, we're only going to focus in on the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. That's what the, the Sadducees focused on. And they, they didn't actually follow or recognize all of the teachings of the rabbis that came after that. Uh, additionally, the Sadducees were known for, for really just believing that this life that we're experiencing right now is all that there is. There is there's no eternal life. There's no heaven or hell. There's no angels or demons. Like This physical life is the extent of what we will experience. And so the Sadducees were, really were a very different group than the Pharisees. But they had, because they had aligned themselves with the Roman Empire, they held political power. So that, that high priest, imagine him. Yes, he was, he was Jewish, but also he was very comfortable in the halls of the Roman government because that's how he, he maintained his status of power within the, the institution. All right, we'll keep going. Verse 19 says, But an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail during the night and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and tell the people all about this life. Hearing this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. So the apostles are arrested. They're thrown in jail. The, 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 basically, the, the prison guards go to sleep for the night. They're like, hey, they're, they're good. They're, they're locked away. And they wake up, and they're gone. God sent an angel. And here's the ironic thing. If you, if you bust out of prison, right, if someone breaks you out of prison, you would think that they'd say, hey, now like, you're free. Go hide. Like, get out of town so they don't catch you. You know where they go? They go back to the same place where they got arrested. They're like, no, we're going to keep telling others about Jesus. It says, when the high priest and those who were with him arrived, they convened the Sanhedrin. That's like the Supreme Court of the land. Like, this is Congress, Supreme Court, all rolled up in one. They bring the leaders of the people together and, and the full council of the Israelites and sent orders to the jail to have them brought. But when the servants got there, they did not find them in jail. So they returned and reported. They said, we found the jail securely locked with the guards standing in front of the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. And as the captain of the temple police and the chief priests heard these things, they were baffled about them, wondering what would come of this. I'm sure their their first thought was, one, how did this happen? But also the second thought is, man, I'm going to get in so much trouble. Right? Like, I had one job to make sure these guys didn't escape. I walk in and they're gone. You're like, how am I going to explain this? What am I going to say? They're not going to believe me. But here's what happened. It says, someone came 
and reported to them and said, look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the commander went with the servants and brought them in without force because they were afraid the people might stone them. After they brought them in, they had them stand before the Sanhedrin. And the high priest asked, said, didn't we strictly order you not to teach in this name? Look, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Which, of course, they were. They said, don't be telling people that, that Jesus is the Messiah and that, that he was unjustly arrested and crucified and rose again. That, that is a message we want to suppress. Like, you don't need to be getting people all fired up about that. Well, you, and we told you, man, don't tell anybody about it. And here's what they said. Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than people. I want to push pause just for a moment because I I think this topic is is relevant to us in our day of what does it look like for us to follow Jesus in, in, in 2022? Because there may be times, both now and in the future, where you feel a conflict between what government mandates us to do and your faith as a Christian. And what do we do with that? How do we, how do we manage that tension? Well, the Bible tells us a couple of things. In Romans chapter 13, it says that all authority, all government authority, whether it's good authority or bad authority, whether it's someone you voted for or someone that you campaigned against, whether it's a, a dictator or a king, it says all authority is established by God. Right, there's, there's, not, there's not a ruler on the planet who, who God could not remove in a flash of a second. Right? So God is, is ordaining, he is allowing the people who are in power to be in power. Right? No one goes against God. It's all part of his will. And so if someone is in a seat of power, one of the things that we can be confident in is whether we like it or not, whether they are a just ruler or an unjust ruler, we know that God has allowed them to be in that position. And because of that, Romans 13 tells us that there's an inherent uh, respect that we should have for the people who are in those positions of authority. In fact, uh, oftentimes God will use those people to carry out his will. I mean, one of the functions of government is to, to care for its citizens and to protect its citizens. And so I think God actually ordains that in a good and positive way. The, the, the issue is, what happens when that God-ordained government contradicts what we know to be true in Scripture? What do we do with that? Well, I can tell you this. God's law always supersedes man's law. And so if there's ever a conflict between what God wants you to do and what the government wants you to do, we choose God. Like if, if we have to choose, who are we going to fear? Are we going to fear God's wrath or the government's wrath? We fear God's wrath. That's where our respect comes from. In fact, here in Acts chapter 5, the story we read last week, remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira? Where, where they were dishonest about their giving, and so God struck them down. That story is in the Bible, I think, in place strategically where it is to remind us that God is a God of holiness. He is a God who we should fear. Not, now, not in a, a Halloween sort of fear, but a, a healthy respect. That's what the fear of the Lord is, that we recognize His supremacy and His authority, His glory, and His power. And so if we're going to choose... <coughs> Who am I going to disappoint? Who am I going to, who am I going to make mad? Am I going to make God mad? Or the government? The answer is clear. It's the government. Now, what does that look like? What does it look like for us to keep a Romans 13 respect for authority and yet still be true to our values? True to our faith? I think a couple things. Um, you can look at the book of Daniel in the Old Testament is just a beautiful example where, where Daniel was taken into the court of the Babylonian king and he faced some of those questions. Am I going to compromise my beliefs in order to fit in? And he doesn't. He refused to do so. And so there's a, there's a really history of Christians respectfully 
declining to obey government. It's called civil disobedience. That's the modern term for it. You think about the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King. Like, he didn't go burn down any buildings, but there's a say, hey, listen, this law is an unjust law, and we can campaign against it, uh, but also we're going to refuse to obey it if it's unjust. And so what the kind of, the, I, I guess, the, the kind of two principles that I would suggest for us as we think about this is if you feel compelled not to follow a government directive that you feel is in direct violation of your faith, okay? Then there are two things. One, you decline to obey in a Christianly way. Like, as you protest against that and you're choosing not to do that, it doesn't give you the right or the excuse to, to then violate God's commands in other ways, for example, like the destruction of property or hurting people in a violent sort of way. And so you believe this law is unjust. You, you don't prove the righteousness of your cause by violating God's other standards and principles. Right? So we're, we're going to stay within uh, God's framework for what is right and just. And that's part of even the moral authority that Christians can have is when they respectfully and kindly say, no, this is not right, and I'm going to stand in, in righteousness for it. So, so we have to disobey in a Christianly way, but then also we have to be prepared to face the consequences. We have to be prepared to say, listen, I, I do in fact believe this to be true, and I think the, the rules should be changed, I think the laws should be changed, but in the meantime, if I suffer consequences, I, I suffer consequence. And that's actually the picture that we see in Scripture. I mean, in the Old Testament, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they said, hey, listen, you're going to have to bow down to this idol. And if you don't bow down to the idol, we're going to throw you into the flames. And they said, listen, we believe God can save us, but even if he doesn't, we won't do it. In other words... We're prepared to face the consequences. And I think that's exactly how the apostles were. That they said, hey, look, we're going to preach the gospel. We're going to tell people about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We're going to tell people about the new life that they can have in him. And if you throw us in prison, then you throw us in prison. If you kill us, then you kill us. But we fear God. We don't fear man. And so... Uh, by the way, I think the difference between a Christian preference and a conviction is your willingness to suffer for what you believe. That's when you find out real quick. Listen, I'm not excited about paying income taxes. Any of you guys? Man, I'm not. But I can't say in it with any sort of integrity that my faith leads me not to contribute to society. In fact, Jesus tells us that Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, right? There's a role that we have to play. And so I'm not going to stand up and say, hey, it's just a religious conviction that I don't have to do this, right? It's not a cop-out. It's not a way to kind of get around things that we don't really want to do. No, if it is in fact a sincerely held belief that is coming from your faith, one of the things you've got to do is be prepared to suffer the consequence of not doing it. And that may be losing a job. It may mean having to, to face some sort of penalties from the government. But if, in fact, that's what we believe we have to stand for. And, you know, guys, I, I don't know what that will look like for us in the next 20, 30, 40 years. I don't think any of us do. But, but my guess is that increasingly there are going to be those times where we run up against our convictions and what the government tells us to do. So we have to, to study ourselves. We have to be ready, ready for it. All right, back to the story. So Peter says really boldly, he says, we must obey God rather than people. And then verse 30 says, the God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had murdered by hanging him on a tree. God exalted this man to his right hand as ruler and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. 
And those three verses actually are just a great picture of the core message of Christianity, the gospel. That here, Jesus really did come, and he lived a perfect life, but man, you arrested him and and murdered him on the cross. But that's not the end of the story, that he rose from the grave, and now we have repentance is now available to us. God made a way for us to turn from our sins and turn back to him. We do that through faith in the work of Jesus on the cross. So what what a beautiful explanation of the gospel. Verse 33 says, when they heard this, they were enraged. And they weren't just mildly frustrated. So they were enraged. They were so angry. They were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee, this is that other group, this is one of the the fundamentalist group, right? The Sadducees were kind of aligned with the Romans. And then the Pharisees, Uh, We're a different group, but they're all part of this kind of supreme court. So the Pharisee named uh, Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was respected by all the people, stood up at the Sanhedrin and ordered the men to be taken outside for a little while. He says, let's talk. Men of Israel, be careful about what you're about to do to these men. Some time ago, Theodos rose up claiming to be somebody. And a group of about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, and all his followers were dispersed and came to nothing. After this man, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and attracted a following. He also perished, and all his followers were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, stay away from these men and leave them alone. For if this plan or if this work is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You may even be found fighting against God. Some wisdom there. He says, listen, I've been around. I've seen this before. There have been lots of guys who've claimed to be the Messiah. And and there's a little little trend where people get excited about it and they they claim that their guy's the guy. But give it some time, it'll pass. It's a phase. And he says, listen, and if it's not a phase, then maybe it's actually from God. And we don't want to be opposing God. So he makes a pretty convincing argument and says they were persuaded by him. And after they called in the apostles and had them flogged, they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and release them. Then they went out from the presence of the Sanhedrin, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to be treated shamefully on behalf of the name. Every day in the temple and in various homes, they continued teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what it would have been like? That there's this resolve within them to say, listen, we cannot stay silent. It doesn't matter what you do to us. It doesn't matter how many times you tell us to keep quiet. You can arrest us. You can behead us. We're not going to stay silent. Is that inspiring to you guys? Like, do you hear that and go, man, isn't that awesome? You know, well, I had that sort of faith. Have you ever kind of wondered that? Like, how you would respond to, to persecution? Like, I mean, here, here in the U.S., let's be honest, on a, on a scale of 1 to 100, like, we're not, we're not a 99 persecution. Right? You want to go to North Korea? You want to go to some, some countries in the Middle East? And they experience real persecution. We're, we're following Jesus uh, is essentially a death sentence. That you, if you publicly proclaim that you are a Christian, it's like, it's like signing a, a death warrant. And there are places in the, in the world that are like that. It's not like here. But we do face opposition. And, and so you have to wonder, hey, if put in that position, what would I do? And you know what one of the best indicators of, of what you would do? It's actually what you do now. I mean, think about it. Like, no one is telling you that you can't talk about Jesus. No one is saying, hey, if you talk about Jesus, we're going to arrest you. We're going to beat you. We're going to throw you in prison. What's stopping us now? And so I don't want to wait until I find out whether I'm up against it, where someone tells me, no, I can't. No, we can and yet we don't. Isn't that messed up? 
You want to know why the church in America is struggling and the church in global parts of the world is booming? It's because they actually practice that. Their faith is, is not just something they do uh, on Sundays. It's not just like a little check mark in their, their life, but their faith actually consumes their whole identity and it drives them to, to live the way they do, live and love the way they love and to share this good news. But you know, we're here in America. We have almost total freedom to be able to share that and the American church actually struggles to ever do that. Listen, I, I don't want to be that way. Man, this message, this truth about who Jesus is and what he's done for us is too good to be kept secret. And at the end of the day, I don't want to live for my own glory. I want to live for God's glory. And I don't want to be intimidated because I'm worried about government pushback or, or even social pushback. Just within friends and family and community members. I, I don't want to let that stop me because... I know the truth of the gospel. I know it's true. And I want to build my life around it. What about you? Do you believe that? And God wants to use you. I don't know your life. I don't know your circumstances. But man, I know that no one else has the exact same group of friends, family, and contacts that you do. And you are uniquely positioned in a way that I'm not. And each one of us has a different story. Each one of us has a different kind of sphere of influence that we could lean into. And what, don't we want to see God's kingdom move? Don't we want to see people come to know him? Guys, if that's going to happen, we've got to step up. We've got to step up. We can't just, just kind of hope that someone else will do it. That the people who are really evangelistic, that they'll do it. No, this is a call for all of us. And you say, man, I, if I had to choose between God and the government, if I had to choose between God and people unfriending me on Facebook, I guess they're just going to unfriend me. Because this is what I believe. This is how God has changed my life. And that's a conviction worth standing for. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm thankful for your word today, and um, it really is my prayer that we would be the type of church, not just kind of organizationally, but even individually with the people here in this room, who our, our beliefs aren't just something that we conveniently say, but that we're willing to actually sacrifice for. We're willing to put our money where our mouth is. We're willing to stand up. And even if it costs us, God, we're willing to pay the price because you paid a price for us. God, so that price is, we're glad to pay it. We're glad to pay it. What a sacrifice. What an honor it is for us to stand up for you. God, I, I do want to pray just for our nation. Scripture tells us to pray uh, for our leaders. And so right there in your seat, would you do this? Would you pray for our elected officials, knowing that Romans 13 tells us it is God who puts them in authority, whether that's here in our city, our state, our nation. Just as the Holy Spirit brings people to mind, would you just pray for our elected leaders that God would give them wisdom, that they would lead with righteousness and integrity? And as part of that, we, we know election season can be contentious. So we pray over the next couple weeks uh, that the people of God really lead out and what it looks like to, to engage and to serve our nation, but that we do so in a way that reflects the goodness and the character of God. Heavenly Father, that is our prayer today. God, would you advance your kingdom right here on the island throughout Galveston County and beyond. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.